Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this lightning talk session. Uh, so we have six presentations and we will have some time for questions. So if you do have a question, uh, this will ask a question box. Um, we also have another session after this one at uh, 4.15. Uh, so it's Alberto Cairo talking about the art of insight, making decisions and visualizations. Uh, so we'll get started with um, Josephine Browning, who's a business intelligence manager at NHS Gloucestershire CCG, and she'll be presenting on how to automate our markdown with PER. So welcome, Josephine. And Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can hear and see me. Um, and get my project slides up. So we, um, in Gloucestershire, as part of the One Gloucestershire um, ICS, um, as part of our COVID response as, as, an, as a system, we decided to um, write out to our um, patients and, um, sorry, we, we, let me get this, let's jump over. So we ended up writing 3,000 letters out to our shielding patients as part of our COVID response. So why do we need to write 3,000 letters? Um, so we had over 10,000 patients that were identified as requiring to shield. And to help some of our GPs, we set up a call centre to contact all of the identified patients for a welfare check. Uh, this was optional for our GPs, so some of our practices signed up and some of them didn't. So in, in all, we had about 3,000 patients that we contacted. And as part of this process, the patients were asked a series of questions, um, ensuring they understood, understood what shielding was and whether they were being asked to do it and also offering them help and advice. So if they needed any prescriptions getting, if they needed help getting food, uh, we could make sure that was all in place for them. Um, and following each phone call, we had to create a transcript and send that to each GP practice for all of those patients. Um, and that was where we came in. So how do we write all of those PDFs without having to write 3,000 individual letters? Um, so, the first job we did is we used our markdown and we created a letter template that we could populate for each patient. Um, and this was, we wrote this to output to a PDF file format because that's easier to be uploaded onto the GP systems. And we used um, the, the function of inline code so that we could have the questions laid out quite nicely and then we could just pop the answers underneath um, and do that automatically. And we use the params functionality so that we could run this each, so we could input an NHS number and it would run for, for each patient. Um, we inserted a SQL to R link so, so that for this automation to work in the top of our R markdown, it would individually go and run off um, all the data for that particular record each time. Um, in hindsight, we could have pre run that all into a data frame. So it was sat there at the beginning and then it would just run against that data frame. Um, but we needed to set it up quite quickly to start the process and get these letters out. So uh, we, we scripted it in that way. Um, and, and then we also used the, um, the linking code to create a data frame to run the per function over so that we knew which patients we were going to run this off for each time. Um, so per is part of the tidyverse. So hopefully some of you have come across it and used it before. And there's a lot of useful functions in per. Uh, for this particular project, we used the walk to function, but map is also part of per, and that's quite a nice place to start. And it's a nice way to code uh, for loops in R. So if you know that you're going to iterate over a specific set of things, then map is a nice way to do that. Um, like I said, we used the walk to function in this because we didn't need to see the outputs while it was running. We just wanted it to run, run the R markdown and save it down for us. Um, so putting this all together, we the R markdown template just needed an NHS number to produce each letter. And then the walk to function needed a data frame of NHS numbers and GP purchase codes that we would iterate over. And then the output was a PDF letter created for each NHS number saved into a separate folder for each GP practice, which meant that then all we had to do once it had run was to zip that file and send it out to each practice, um, saved us going through and working out which patients was whose. So this is the 
function we wrote to render the reports. Um, and then this is what we fed to the walk to function. So all it does is um, it's a really simple few lines of code, but it's amazing how long it takes to come up with a few lines of code. Um, it takes the NHS number and the practice in, in a file name so that it would save it into a file name of the practice code and call the file that the NHS number of the patient. And then um, it just inputs our, our markdown script, which is our template file, outputs as a PDF file, calls the output file the file name, and then we give it the parameters, um, a list of NHS numbers is, is the NHS number in our data frame. And the walk to function is, is literally just one line of code, which is great because this is one line of code ran off 3,000 reports for us. Um, so it takes, so we use walk to rather than walk, we needed to take two separate parameters. So it needed to take the NHS number from our data frame and it also needed the practice code from our data frame to feed into that render the report function. And then all we did is, is hit go and it just churned through all of those reports. Um, and, it, and, and stored them separately in all the files just to make it easier to send out. So quite simple code in the end, but what it meant is that then no one had to put together 3,000 letters, which, which would have been um, what would have happened otherwise, which was quite a lot of work for our commissioners to do. Um, and then just a quick thanks slide to Anna and Lee. So Anna set up most of the R Markdown template for this for us, so without her we, we couldn't have got it working so quickly. And Lee manages our data warehouse and got the data in really nice SQL table format for us. We didn't have to do any manipulation with it first, which makes things so much easier. So I'll stop sharing there. And um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. That was really interesting. And it's, I'm really glad you didn't have to put together 3,000 letters yourself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we've got one question. So how long did it take and how much time do you think this saved versus the old way? Um, so it probably, because we were kind of learning as we were doing, we'd not done this sort of thing before and jumping over the technical hurdles of trying to get my mic text on the computer so we could write to PDF in the first place. It probably took us um, a week or so to pull it together in amongst other things we were doing at the time. Um, and then as far as time saved, I mean, that, that's a week to pull it all together and then sort of running time of the process versus someone manually typing out 3,000 letters. Um, Sounds like so you yeah. have a lot of time. So I might imagine quite, quite, quite a time saver. Yeah. I guess also, would you say it reduces the risk of error as well? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so because it's not being like manually handled, manually typed out, at least it's coming straight in there. Um, it's just being brought in directly from the SQL table. So it's just pulling in the transcripts. Um, okay. I can see Sylvia so commented in the chat. Thanks, Sylvia. I did use your um, training on Sharingan last week to write that presentation. So thanks for that. <laughs> Um, so we've got one more question. So, has it needed maintenance, maintenance, or provided some unexpected results? Um, um, thankfully, not. Um, so, for the most part, it just it worked. Um, occasionally, we had a little blip where it because we were running them daily, so we were running off about um, two to three hundred letters each day. So that running process took a little while. It took between thirty seconds and a minute to produce each letter. Um, we had a few times where it crashed out if a GP practice wasn't already in the folder. So when they added a new practice onto the list, then we had to stop it and restart it. Um, but thankfully, we didn't have any major issues with that. OK, great. Thank you. Um, I think we might have time for one more quick question. Um, um, so Tom asked, how long did it take to run? Did you consider, consider using fur? And uh, no, I, a way of running things in parallel. We didn't. We didn't look at running it in parallel just because it, it needs to be done quite quickly, and we did it in that process. But I think if we were to run a similar thing again, we would look to parallel run. Um, and then myself and Anna split um, split the work, so we took a few GP practices each and ran it. So we, we ran it on two machines. But obviously, if we could make our run in parallel, then it would um, work faster. Okay, great. 
Well, thank you very much. I think we'll have to move on to the next talk now, which will be Lydia Bricks, who is a data scientist at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And she'll be sharing um, about a cohort comparison tool for exploratory data analysis. So thank you, Lydia. And if you could share your screen. Thank you. So I think we should be able to see it now. So um, hi, everyone. Thank you for virtually coming to this talk and thanks to the organisers and speakers for a fantastic conference we've had over the past few days. Um, I'm Lydia and I'm a data scientist within the digital research environment um, at Great Ormond Street Hospital and I'll be presenting a cohort comparison tool for exploratory data analysis. So um, just as a quick look at what the digital research environment is, um, we're a small team who provide clinicians and researchers with the analytical tools um, to make accessing and harnessing the power of healthcare data as easy as possible. Um, we support data extraction from the, from the electronic patient um, record system, and we use our data extraction pipelines to provide clinical data to our researchers. As a result of these processes that the engineering team um, have um, come up with, um, we provide a lot more data than, was, than what was previously um, available. And we also support external and internal data analytics and data science projects as well. So the scope for a cohort comparison tool um, stems from the fact that a large amount of um, healthcare information is presented to researchers and clinicians, which can be challenging to process and take a long time to sort through to identify trends. So it can be difficult um, to identify differences between um, different patient groups and to identify those trends. Um, all of the information presented is often quite varied and it can include both patient and hospital administrative um, data as well. So with this, it can um, the development of a tool that inputs all the data and displays a set of predefined analytics would be useful. And that's where Cockatoo comes in as a cohort comparison tool for exploratory data analysis. So to look at the development of Cockatoo, um, it starts with data extraction, as I previously mentioned. So the DRE have established core data sets of research relevant clinical data, which is structured. It contains core information and the um, patient information is de-identified when it um, is up on our research platform. So the data sets are um, presented to, uh, as research data views and include information on hospital admissions, ward stays, patient lab results, demographics, um, et cetera. So there are three main R files that work behind the scenes um, and govern how Cockatoo works. The first of which is a global.r file. And this is responsible for installing and loading R packages um, for what's needed to make this tool work. It also responsible for um, importing all the RDVs and can include the initial wrangling um, for more relevant information. So, for example, um, creating age groups from patient ages, um, ethnicity groups from ethnicity names, etc. The next R file is a functions file, which uh, unsurprisingly um, contains and controls the plot visualizations um, functions and is responsible for the overall like, look and stylized bits of how the report looks at the end. The final file is the project specification file, and this is where we, as guided by uh, the researchers, um, define the groups of patients to be compared to one another by incorporating the project-specific rules. So if you look into this um, project specification file in a little bit more detail, um, this is where the researcher um, imports how the groups are to be split, and this generates a cohort flag, which is then applied to all of the RDVs. So if we take an example with chronic kidney disease project, um, what we've done here is in, loaded up the um, diagnosis um, RDV, and we've filtered for patients with a diagnosis code relating to chronic kidney disease. Um, this project is, in, um, is interested in looking at a cohort control split, looking at patients with a stage five chronic kidney disease diagnosis as the cohort group and comparing them to patients with a stage one, two, three or four chronic kidney disease diagnosis. And that's what the top of this code is um, looking at doing it here with the generating with the generation of a cohort um, flag as a function. This bottom bit of code here just takes this um, cohort flag and applies it to the other RDVs 
in a looped process. So as the development of Cockatoo has been done um, to be using um, generalized code, it means the researcher can easily investigate other cohort control splits with only minor adaptations to that project specification file. An extension of this um, actually allows um, Cockatoo to be deployed to researchers um, of any specialty within GOSH. Again, because of the um, structured um, RDBs that are generated from our um, data extraction processes and the generalized code, which means they again can just do um, their adaptations to the project specification file and they too can generate out um, a report showing the initial exploratory data analysis. So the output, um, everything's done into an R markdown, which is then knitted to a PDF file. And some examples of what's shown here, again, on the chronic kidney disease, includes looking at your lab test comparisons from your cohort control split. You've got um, your time to next admissions, your differences in age groups. And there's also um, the possibility of including more advanced analytics, like survival analysis, by just making your specification file a little bit um, more detailed with what you want to present on. So to summarize, Cockatoo is a cohort comparison tool which utilizes the DRE's data extraction pipeline and it uses generalized R code to present clinical information to the researcher. Um, it has the ability to be used by researchers in any GOSH clinical specialty with a modification of the specification file to import any project rules. So the future of Cockatoo looks at developing um, an R Shiny app for a more interactive experience for the researcher. And that leads me to the end of my talk and my acknowledgements. So thank you to everyone who I work with in the DRE team. Thanks. Thanks, Lydia. That was um, super interesting. So let me check. I think we should have a, uh, a few questions. So we've got one. So how have you integrated the national patient data opt out within this flow? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, no, of course. How have you integrated the national patient data opt out within this flow? Um, and so, uh, the, it applies, I think that's. Yeah, I, I don't think that applies. The data we have is, um, yeah, it takes that into consideration. So, this is all like the output of, of what is allowed. Excellent. So we do have, I think, a few more minutes for questions, if anyone um, has got any. Um... I think we'll give people one, a few seconds to type. Perhaps a whistle stop tour of cockatoo. <laughs> yeah, I really like the name. I haven't actually had it before, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent... Uh... How are you going to deploy the app, by the way? I'll just take the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I think it can, well, if researchers are, um, you know, like are happy to use R, we can send them the tool. And the, the function file has like an if require, so it'll, if they have R on their laptops, they can just, you know, um, install all the packages to get it the tool to actually work, or it can be researcher led and we do it. Um, so if we do it, run a data extraction process on their specialty, and then we it's kind of like kick, click and plug um, to generate their report out. So it can be either way, depending on the researcher okay. if they if they like using R or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they all love using R. <laughs> um, so we've got a few questions. Um, so can this be helpful for matched studies? Um, can you uh, like elaborate on that a little bit more? What do you mean by matched studies? Sorry. Uh, so my Christina. guess would be, Christina, correct me in the wrong in the, if I'm wrong in the chat, um, when you have one group and one, one group of interest and one one intervention group and one control group, I guess, which sounded very similar to what you were talking about. Yeah, so in the project specification file, you can uh, adapt it to any kind of split that you want. Um, 
And so it doesn't have to be based on patients, really, because um, whatever you define will be filtered to the other RDBs if appropriate. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers it a little bit. Apologies if I've not. Um, uh, so essentially you could, yeah. Oh, to see how similar they are. Like, um, yeah, I'm sure that could be incorporated um, with the hard coding involved in the specification file. Well, there's scope for the um, development of that as it is a work in progress. Okay. And then we've just got one question about your background, and I think that will be the last one until, um, until we move on. Um, I um, have a, if we take um, education, I have a master's in medicinal biological chemistry and then I went on to do a chemistry PhD. Um, so I'm relatively new to healthcare data. Um, it's been like a fun challenge. So I was doing a lot with machines where the data was perfect um, and uh, fitting models to that. So healthcare data, when things are, you know, imported into a system by humans and so machines, like there's a lot more to think about. Um, but it's been like a fun and interesting challenge and I'm really enjoying looking at healthcare data. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was interest, super interesting and a great name thank for your uh, project. <laughs> thank you very much. So I'm going to welcome one of your colleagues, uh, Will Bryant, who's also a data scientist at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, and he's going to tell us how to solve surgery waiting times, which I think we're all very keen to um, find out. So welcome, Will. And I'll mute myself. Hi, thank you, <coughs> Emma. Um, so I, a quick uh, spoiler, I haven't solved surgery waiting times. Um, so uh, my name's Will Bryant. I, I lead the analytics team at GOSH. Uh, I'm sorry, not at GOSH, within the digital research environment team at GOSH, and I work closely with Lydia. Um, and uh, this is just really a whistle-stop tour of the way we're approaching a number of projects that have come to us um, over the last six months. Uh, mostly post post COVID in direct response to that. Um, um, so, let me let me just resize that. Um, so. I don't know how to use this, apologies. Um, yeah, so the digital research environment, uh, Lydia spoke about it a little bit. We, we support over 150 projects providing data um, and we have an analytics platform um, supplied by a company called Iridia um, that's powered by our, um, we have uh, data pipelines and data engineers pro provisioning data from our electronic patient record system, that's EPIC. Um, and we have our analytics team uh, looking now at leveraging the data that we've uh, managed to provide. Um, in terms of, th there are two motivations behind what we're doing. One is based on the outputs, so the clinical outputs, and one is based on developing our processes. Um, so for this particular case study, there are, there are hundreds of elective surgeries within the trust that have been cancelled due to COVID-19. There's no capacity for additional theatres um, within the trust. Uh, and so what we're looking at is at, at getting operational efficiency uh, in order to drive catch up. Um, from the point of developing our own processes, we want to develop rapid, agile projects. And what we need to do is show the value of data driven methodology within the trust. Um, so what we were looking at doing was a swift uh, proof of concept, uh, developing reusable code and a reusable workflow, um, predict surgery length, much more challenging than just the short time we had available, um, but also to show and quantify the potential efficiencies that could be gained uh, using a scheduling algorithm. Um, <clears throat> the methods, we have patient clinical data um, touched upon by Lydia in the previous talk, um, coming from our EPR system. Um, we use Drake uh, to develop our workflows, that's a, an R package, and GitLab, which um, does our version control, and also uh, we, we do project management through GitLab. Um, 
For the surgery scheduling part, uh, we've used mixed integer linear programming. Uh, those are the packages we've, uh, we've used for that. And for the surgery duration estimation, um, Lydia, in fact, did this part of the work, uh, did a number of uh, statistical analytical approaches, um, and we settled finally on, on XG Boost as a, as a good contender uh, to straightforwardly apply to our data. Uh, so I'll talk through the advantages of Drake without really showing you much about it, just to, to, to whet your appetites. Um, so this encourages us to functionalize all of the code that we use, um, which is great for reuse. Um, so we have standardized data sets, which means that we can standardize our functions to work on those data sets across multiple projects. Um, we have a one function per file policy within the development process, which is great for version control and multiple people developing simultaneously. Um, and we also, uh, Drake operates using a higher level uh, plan file. Um, so this is a single R file, um, R script, if you like, that just has a list of functions and targets. Um, so what, and that is great, again, for collaboration and for also having a very high level um, overview of the project uh, as a whole within a single file. Incidentally, it's pretty good at providing useful error messages, which has previously for me been a big bugbear in R. Um, so I just wanted, there's a tiny snippet of Drake code here, but in the interest of time, I won't go through it. Essentially, what it does is it provides you with a way of defining a set of outputs like data frames and plots and models, um, which are only recalculated if um, the dependencies of those have, have changed. So it's quite computationally efficient. So quickly looking at the monthly uh, scheduling op optimization, we have retrospective cardiac theatre data, that's for two theatres within the trust. Um, we have so-called perfect data, so we know the length of every um, surgery, but it's retrospective, so we can put an upper limit on the efficiency gain, um, which was around for the data between May and January this year, and was around 10%. Um, now that depends on some unrealistic assumptions that we've got, um, just to be clear, but there is some um, facility for that. Um, just quickly on this, because also I don't have much time for this, but what we observed when we were looking at lab results was that within the trust, there are no lab results for which every patient who has surgery done them has taken. So this is looking at which tests were done, irrespective of the result. And the most frequent tests were only taken, were only done on 75% of patients. So that was quite interesting for us. And I put to one side the um, a phylogeny of the patient, the test taking profile of patients, um, just because it's pretty. Um, so the scheduling optimization. Um, oh, I've done that one. Haven't I? Sorry. Um, so discussion. So we've initially explored the point of surgery prediction. We've only got 693 cases, so that's going to have to be expanded um, to look at. As surgeries across the trust. We've got 12 features so far, and we're looking to expand that across our, our other data sets. The scheduling shows that optimization is possible, um, but we need hospital engagement. Uh, oh, wrong button again. Uh, so, the outlook, so there's a lot of potential here for, for data driven efficiency. Um, one of the big things that we need is uh, engagement from the trust, and we're currently working with. Uh, engaging the executives um, around this sort of thing. And I think there's a lot of interest now that we have our EPA in place and we've got this, this focal uh, need to work more efficiently with our data. Um, so I'll leave it there. That just acknowledgement. So Lydia's done a fair amount of this modeling work and our data engineers, John and Mo, have done a great job providing us with the data. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave. Oh, yes, sorry. And Richard Lissett is our clinical expert who's given us some invaluable advice. Great. Thank you, Will. Um, I think there are a few sound issues, but hopefully people will have, have some questions. 
Um, I might just use my privilege as chair to ask one in the meantime. So are you planning on kind of rerunning things in a few months and then using it once COVID is over or are you using it during COVID as well? Um, results, so I mean. This uh, this was done as a proof of concept. So what we've what we will do is actually one of the um, one of the execs wants to see it uh, in action. It's not really ready for that, but we'll we'll explore how we're going to be using that as time goes on. Um, one of the things about it is that you don't necessarily need to predict the exact length of a surgery. Um, what you might want to do is put an upper bound on it so that you can increase the utilization um, and of surgery of theatres and minimize the on the day cancellations, which is a big issue. Okay, thank you. So we've got two questions. So the first is why is Drake? Um, because apparently when you Google it, it comes up as an America tax solution. If you if you search R Drake, I think it comes up. Let me um let me see if that uh, well, no, yeah. So if you do R Drake, I think that works. Um, Perfect. And then we've got one more question and I think we have to move on. So yeah. um great example of of optimization for efficiency. Um how about patient discharge and any complications? Um, so could you repeat that again? Yeah. How about have you considered patient discharge and any uh, complications after surgery? Um, no, we haven't yet. We're um, the. It's an interesting question. I mean, we have looked internally at um, you know length of stay for, for instance, in um, ICUs. Um, and it, I mean, there's a similar question to be asked there around the flow within the hospital, which is a big area that we're moving into. Um, yeah. OK, um, I think one last question. So did you use XGBoost package or Tidal models package or maybe Carrot? It was the XGBoost. OK, thank you very much. Um, and Lydia has posted a link to Drake in the chat. So anyone who's interested could could learn more. So thank you very much, Will. Uh, and we're going to move on to the next presentation, um, if, um, which is Skerge, who is the co-founder of RX Studio. Um, and he'll be talking about integrating R in a model-informed precision, precision dosing web application. Uh, so welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. And I'll mute myself. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gergely Dorotsian from RX Studio, and I will focus on how we use R as the main backend in our PKPD modeling or precision dosing web application. A uh, little bit about myself, because I do not have a very decent uh, background in life sciences, but I've been working with R for like 15 years, have a couple of packages on CRAN related to reporting, some API integrations like AWS and Facebook, and more recently, uh, R packages related to using R in production, like logging and secure database connections, and uh, been uh, trying to be an active part of the R community in the past, like organizing the first Saturday conference, the second ERAM, and so on. I've been working with R, teaching R, and I always had some side projects where I was really interested in making R available and accessible to folks who are not using R at all in the means of creating web applications heavily relying on R. And one example is most recently RX Studio. And just to keep it short, the goal of this was to make PKPD models accessible to those who might not have access to R or who might not be proficient with R, and not only uh, from a technical limitation, but also uh, making PKPD models available for those who might not speak English. So creating a web application with proper localization, with uh, country-specific unit of measurements, translations, date and time formats, and so on. And uh, this is uh, just a quick demo so that you get a better understanding. So once you log into the web application, you pick a drug or PKPD modeling method like Bayesian adaptive dosing or empiric therapy or just uh, drawing some CFR or PTA plots. You pick a PKPD target 
and uh, you provide some information on the patient. Uh, besides that, whatever else information might be available, for example, for the patient, adoptive dosing, uh, historical records, uh, what dosing regimens you might consider for administering, and then uh, this web application hits some cloud services calling our functions, and it will uh, run a couple thousands of simulations and show the simulated concentrations, and based on that, suggest, in this case, for example, an extending dosing for vancomycin, or in other cases, for example, this was an empiric uh, dosing example coming up with a given suggestion for loading dose and maintenance dose. So this is the web application. And in the background, we have, of course, a lot of R code. And I'm always happy to talk about those, but I will just focus on some interesting points here. So one example we needed to do as an extension to base R is updating factors so that those will loudly fail if you're trying to use a category which is not listed as the factor levels. This is just to make sure that if we see an unknown category, the model will fail and let the developer know instead of just silently trying to work with an NA. Another example here, this is a simple function just calculating 24-hour AUC. And as you can see, the calculation is fairly simple. Most of the function body is just about validating the input data just to make sure that uh, the data format is all right. And then the calculation, we try to make that efficient. And we are really heavily relying on data table operations here so that everything is uh, working uh, efficiently. So this is the main slide of my talk uh, where I try to summarize uh, the overall infrastructure of RX Studio. And this involves a lot of software as a services. And you might wonder why and why don't we just create a shiny application? Uh, I will try to answer that in a few minutes. So let's start from the client piece of this diagram. So someone might use a laptop or tablet or mobile to reach our application, which is hosted on AWS Amplify. But it could be hosted elsewhere as well, like Firebase hosting or uh, even GitHub pages or Netlify. But one important thing to note here, because we are dealing with health information, and in many cases, this is actually protected health information as per HIPAA in the United States, we have to make sure that the environment is uh, complying with HIPAA. So actually, GitHub page is not fly, and a few other options are uh, not actually available in this case. Anyway, we are just hosting static HTML and JavaScript and CSS files here. So uh, this is just static files. All the other actual uh, background functions are living in different area of this uh, plot. And the main connector is Cognito in this case, or it could be actually Firebase authentication or Google uh, Cloud Platform as well. This is a software as a service solution for authentication, maybe using password and email, or single sign on like uh, Google or Facebook authentication and so on. And what's really nice about Cognito and uh, Google Cloud Platform that you can, by the way, also use from Shiny is that it's not only doing authentication, but you can use that for authorization as well. For example, if you have some data stored in a database, like in this case, DynamoDB and AWS, but this could be Google Firestore or something else, you can very easily specify who has access to what. So for example, all your users can access their own documents, but maybe admins of a group can access all users' uh, documents. Same stands for user management. So we have cloud functions running Python, uh, JavaScript, sometimes R. And what's really nice that this is, for example, AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Function is uh, really nicely integrated with the authentication service. So you can very easily fine tune who can run a given function. The core of this uh, infrastructure is the modeling API. And this is just a cluster of virtual servers running in the cloud, each server running multiple Docker containers, and basically just a plumber process inside of those. 
sitting behind an elastic load balancer. So when the client makes a request to the modeling backend, first authentication needs to pass. That's being handled by Cognito or Cloud Platform. And then we run the actual R function, generate the plot like you have seen previously, maybe a ggplot2 object return to the user. In the background, there's still a lot going on. So we have proper logging for monitoring and audit purposes. And there are some other pieces as well, uh, very strictly uh, described or you know, uh, regulated by HIPAA. Uh, security and privacy policies like having proper code reviews, proper CI integrations, uh, having unit tests for all our R functions, integration tests to test the results of the models, and may even more end-to-end -end integration tests with uh, the web application as well. I would like to point out a uh, couple R packages that I maintain, which were extremely important in this process. Logger is a general R package for logging so that you can write to a console, a file, maybe to a cloud service uh, or anywhere else. And Boto R is a wrapper around Boto Free Python SDK to access AWS. Uh, so it's just an API integration. I know running out of time. So I will just uh, highly suggest anyone who is interested in more details to check the remaining slides, which includes some more information, how to use the logger package, pointing to documentation, a quick example, what we log when a user request comes in and what information we store, like number of seconds uh, required to run a PKPD model, the amount of memory required to do that. And also a couple examples interacting with AWS, and just highlighting an SDK, which is pretty much just an R mark doc document. So if anyone is interested in contributing a model to this uh, platform, then we can take care of all the model deployment and everything. So once you provide an R mark down like this one, you specify what inputs you might require. We generate the user interface and can run your R function in a HIPAA compliant way. And uh, yeah, I know running out of time, so I will stop here. Thanks everyone. And I would be very happy to answer any questions now or later on, even offline, if there's any. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's uh, super interesting. So we don't have any questions in the box yet. Um, so I was just wondering if this is being used in clinical practice at the moment. Yes, well, uh, so, the current platform is pretty new. I've been working on the on, on a similar project for many, many years, but the RX Studio uh, redesign happened a couple of months ago. So it's been used at a couple of universities and we are very eager to look for early adopters in clinical practice as well. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, not sure if I answered the question. No, you did. Okay. That's, uh, that's exactly my question. Um, so we've got a lot of thank yous and applause in the comments section, uh, but no further questions. All right. So, but your slides will be available. So I'm sure people will of course. see them. And, yeah. um, might thank you very much. So thank you very much. Um, so next, we've got Lee Colson, who's a senior business analyst at NHS Devon CCG. Um, and he'll be sharing how to host um, our shiny server on Ubuntu behind NGINX, which I'm intrigued to find out what it is. So thank you, Lee. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Lee Coulson. I'm going to talk very quickly about hosting shiny server. Um, we've got, um, so probably worth stating, this is just about hosting and configuration, basically. I'm not going to talk much about um, actual developing shiny apps themselves. So I'm a um, analyst by trade, but just get involved, I think, just take an interest generally in networks, IT, web development, things like that. So hence, I think it's fallen on me to um, just set something like this up in Devon, where we've sort of got a mix of technologies. Um, so we've got within the CCG network, we've, we've got various um, web servers all linked up to databases. So hosting different frameworks from .NET Core, we've got Power BI servers. Um, we've also got some servers here that, that um, can push data out or, or can be 
accessed by either practices as long as they're on the health and social care network, uh, the old N3 network. Um, but what we really needed was something where we can get information out to practices via the internet. Now, we had a server here that was running some .NET Core apps and we thought it's a Linux box. So we thought, why not put our Shiny on it and let's see what we can do with that. So if you're looking at hosting your own Shiny server, there's some quite a few prerequisites that you're going to need to do that. So you're going to have to have a um, nice, friendly IT team. They're, they're, they're going to need to set up the server. Well, for us, anyway, they set up the server, installed the operating system. They wire up access to the databases uh, and other, any other services that are needed. Um, you need that clear separation of roles and responsibilities. So I sort of look after most of the, uh, the, the actual Linux side of it, whereas they take over um, IT run uh, the, the networking firewalls and everything else that more the security um uh, type uh stuff um you'll need a bit of knowledge of linux to to run it uh, you also need appropriate permissions um it it tends to run in its own uh, username uh our shiny it sets up its own so it won't have permissions to anything else on your server so you need to be able to set up access to relevant drives and directories etc and you'll also need the relevant user guides now there's a very good one that the, the shiny server configuration is really good and also the document telling you how to download and install shiny server is also really good now, that will all work lovely if you're going to host inside your own network. Uh, if you want to host publicly, um, you're going to need, well, more than like I'd advise, you'll need some sort of front end web server um, that can handle uh, routing and HTTPS and everything else for you. Um, certificate management, we use Let's Encrypt, it's nice and free, same as Nginx, all free. Um, and you don't have to renew your certificates. It does it automatically for you. Uh, you may need to uh, permissions to add subdomains or whatever in NHS DNS so you can um, wire up your apps and URL. And ideally, you're going to want some penetration testing if it's there out on the um, World Wide Web. So looking at our server, we've got uh, Nginx sat on the front. So requests come in from, from whomever on the web. Uh, it's gonna hit Nginx. We actually run two different um, versions. We have, we host some apps for our um, local authority. They want them to be open to the public. So they um, requests come straight down through and hit that server and that they are, um, uh, sent back to the client. Um, we've also got some uh, some of the CCG stuff we want to be not public. So we run that through a proxy authentication, uh, authorization and authentication application. That's, that's written in um, .NET Core. Uh, and so it's, it's Nginx simply routes by the URL. So we've got different URLs set up for these different servers. We maintain a separation, so if you end up at the LA sh Shiny server, you can't hit any of the apps that are on here. Um, technically, um, actually, no. Let's, so to set up your Shiny server, um, you'll need to install the database drivers uh, so you can link up to any SQL databases. Uh, we're linking up, ours are on SQL Server hosted on Windows uh, server setups but but no problem accessing them from linux um, you want to install your nginx and your web server and configure it uh, for https especially um, and then to install your shiny server on linux first of all you install base r the documentation takes you through all this you then install the shiny package in r and then you install shiny server and configure it and to be honest it is easy it takes i reckon about 20 to 30 minutes to do that part at the most. Um, we then in, obviously install and configure any authentic authentication proxy. And then the last thing to do is wire it all up. And what does that mean really? That, that just simply means um, rooting Nginx, setting up your config files in that. So it's going to reverse proxy onto your R Shiny server. 
So to go through the configuration, this is the configuration file in Shiny. It is as simple as this. Uh, for those of you who've looked at Nginx or web servers before, certainly Nginx, this, it follows the exact same structure where you've got server blocks and location blocks. So you can set server, by default, it listens on port um, 3838. Um, we add bits in, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, it, you can only access it from a local host and not over uh, the internet should you manage to somehow bypass Nginx. Um, you can then configure any routing or whatever from this location here if you want to do URL rewriting or anything else or redirects. And then quite simply, you give it the site directory where you're going to host your Shiny apps and uh, you get um, give it the log directory where it's going to um, store the logs. And yeah, we just turn the uh, directory ind index off here. And that is a server. So this is, say, our CCG server. And then we create another server block on a different port for um, our LA uh, requests to come down through. And then that's all hosted. We'll have a different site directory and different log directory. And here's where you'll need all your permissions and things set up because by default, the Shiny process can access these folders here. Um, <clears throat> whereas if you start setting up your own, it won't be able to, so you'll need to configure that. Um, hosting your actual apps on there. So we saw this is the main directory. Um, if you simply pop some subdirectories in there, pop your, uh, App, our Shiny applications in, you simply access them just by um, adding a path to your URL and you can have as many of these as you want. It's nice and easy. You don't really have to do any other config. You just simply set up the folder, drop the apps in it. And as soon as the first person requests it, our Shiny will fire, it, fire up the app and start serving it. Uh, if you make changes, you can just simply drop your app in and overwrite it. And then the next person who then uh, requests that app will get the newer version. Um, if you have, worth pointing out, if you've got configuration code in your app, so if you've got some non-reactive stuff that is just running uh, right at the beginning of the initialization of your app, that only runs once when the app starts. When you do the, when you overwrite it, you won't get, um, that code won't run again. So you can simply just add a file in to here uh, and, um, our Shiny looks at that, and if it sees it's been modified, it will then restart the app for you on the next request. Um, okay, uh, so further work, um, we need to do, so on ours, we're only hosting publicly available data at the moment until our authorization and authentication app is being penetrated properly, uh, penetration tested rather properly, hopefully not penetrated, we don't want anyone coming through. Um, we want to add some more functionality to our internal proxy. So single sign-on will be good. We've got, we're terrible just as everyone else is for having lots of different web apps on lots of different servers or with different logins. Um, it's a pain in the ass for, for GPs or, or practices or anyone else using them. And I think I would like some more separation of concerns. So running <clears throat> those um, separate R Shiny applications, actually let's run them in Linux containers or something so they're even more separated. So another extra layer of security. Um, the res like I say, the resources for setting it up are absolutely excellent. They're really easy to um, follow through. Uh, the Shiny server stuff is nice and easy. IT set Nginx, Nginx up for me on this server, but actually I've set it up before on other servers when we had some on AWS and it is it really is a walkthrough. There's uh, some other good um, resources around if you're using Nginx as a reverse proxy, so the, the, how to configure it um, in this one here, and then let's encrypt for your free, HT, for, or for your free SSL certificates. Um, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, happy to take any questions now or, uh, or or later on. Thank you. So I think we're running slightly over time. So I'll do a super quick question as uh, John gets ready to join. So who runs the authentication proxy? Uh, Chris saying I'd be terrified to do this for fear of running something that's insecure. Yes, that's right. So we've we developed our own 
um, authorization and authentication proxy. You can plug in other ones. Um, OAuth have got their version. Uh, I've got a version that you can plug in, but of course, everything is you're storing everything on OAuth then. Whereas our own one, we can hook up to our um, uh, our own data warehouse and and run it that way. Perfect. Thank but you yes, I, I, th I think it is. Quite, it can be quite nervous. I think that hence why we haven't stored anything public, at, or you know, wouldn't, certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to put anything identifiable behind it yeah. yet until we've done that penetration testing on it. Perfect. Thank you. I think there are two more questions in the question box, which I'm not sure if you can see, but I'm going to have to move on to the next speaker now. But thank you very much, and maybe you can reply in the comments to any other any other questions. But yeah, thank we'll you. That's, thank you. That's super super useful because that. Building the app is easy bit, and then figuring out to share it is hard. So welcome, John uh, McIntosh, who's a business intelligence data analyst at NHS Highland, um, and he'll be sharing some of his data table tricks. So let's get started. Welcome, John. Thank you. Cheers. So yeah, I've um, written three packages now using data table which was a bit of a surprise to me, to be honest, because I didn't know it um, very well at the start of last year. So I'm just going to talk you through these. I hope you can see this all right. So uh, my first package, Run Charter, is based on creating and analyzing run charts, which we use in quality improvement. We use these to tell us if the changes we're making or the care processes we're changing are actually bringing about an improvement. So data plotted over time, you take an initial baseline measurement um, before you start your QI initiative and you use that, the median of these values and that's your target line for assessing your performance in the future, basically. And they're called run charts because each time the data crosses the line, it's a, it's a run. However, I have very many of these charts uh, to look at and to analyze. Um, initially, the charts are, are intended to be used by frontline staff, so they end up on the wall, on the ward, which is great. But then we need to have a organizational view of how we're, we're performing. So eventually, uh, they come off the wall into a spreadsheet, and then um, they need to be collated by somebody, and that's me. So we have a national safety program um, and there are many hundreds of different combinations of hospitals and boards and measures. So as well as having many run charts to look at, they also need to be analyzed using these run chart rules, which again, help us identify if we are making an improvement. So the main two are the shift and the trend rule. Um, so the shift is six or more points above or below the median line. The trend is uh, five or more points consecutively increasing. There's also a rule about too few or too many runs and a, run in the, a rule about uh, the astronomical data point. However, these rules do get some criticism. Um, so as a result, I am only really interested in the top left the shift rule. The too few runs is the basis of a QI charts two package. And that's a really good package for QI. However, I needed to use, I needed to do an analyze using the shift rule. So I built run charter, which does what I needed to do. So it does all the calculations for you, calculates your medians, looks for runs of improvement. And when it finds one, it'll calculate a new median and, and so on. And it returns data and the plot. So what makes it tricky is you can't just look nine points ahead. It might not be apparent um, here, but there is a signal but there's these five points in the middle of it all, which we've, I think was 15 points in the end. So you need to, to take account of these points on the median. Quite easy to use. It's a very minimal um, function call and you end up with a plot and a table showing your initial baselines and any improvements that it's found. If you don't like how it looks, you can change it. It's all very configurable. And you're not limited, you basically, however many groups or wards or departments you have, that can handle it. I think uh, 1990 is my biggest faceted plot at the moment. So 
Um, some things are wrong, in my opinion, pizza, uh, pineapple on a pizza is one of them, but using data table isn't. I think it's a really good package. Uh, it makes life a lot easier for me for doing this sort of analysis. It's got a really nice function, RLEID, which is useful for analyzing runs. It's got great joining uh, and grouping facilities. Um, you can write less code, so there's less chance of going wrong, and actually really helpful error messages, which I find very helpful because I make a lot of errors, obviously. So as well as that, while I was building Run Charter, um, another problem started to crop up. People were trying to figure out how to get accurate census counts, so how many people are in our hospital at any given point in time. And doing it in Excel, or if you haven't got a SQL database to hand, um, can be quite tricky. So this occurred a few times. I started thinking about whether I could do something in data table. Although it did mean, on one hand, I would get better at data table. It also meant I had to work with dates and times, which is a bit fiddly. But anyway, I think I I may have got there. So patient counter, um, including, the including the name, I guess, it helps you answer these sorts of questions. If you haven't got a, a SQL database, or if you don't know SQL, but you have an Excel file with time in and time out, you can use this package and you'll get counts. So at the lowest level, um, this is just like the basic building block. So you could take this, you'll get one row per patient per interval, and you can feed it into another BI tool, for example. Here, if I go back quickly to the little table at the top left there and um, the patient 10 in bed D hasn't been discharged so I ran this on Saturday night and you can see it's, it takes account of the fact that we're still in so it generated about seven and a half thousand rows very very quickly up, up to um, 11 o'clock on Saturday night. You can also get group results so if you want to get um, results by bed or by ward you can do that quite easily. And then just overall totals um, for the day or time in question. You can shave little bits off so that you can specify in different time units. So you can do 15 minutes, five minutes, one minute if you want to. You can also further adjust that by taking minutes or seconds off the start or the end. So here I've got a snapshot of people who were in between nine o'clock and one minute past nine and so on throughout the day. So that's patient counter and then Hopefully, stop at time. SPC Charter is my last package, which is basically run charter, but for SPC charts. So this gives you P charts and U charts for percentages and rates, and C charts for counts. And you can just um, put some extra commands in there to stop the shading occurring. So the, the P charts and U charts, the shading shows the warning limits and the control limits. The C charts, I think, they look better with a straight line. Small multiples, quite easy again, and you can group but by more than one variable as well. So run charter, there are some differences. I'm a bit better now, I guess, I hope, with programming in data table. So the SPC charter, you don't need to quote your variables. You can have two grouping variables um, and you can bear control over, over what comes out at the end of it. So I'm probably going to go back and try and adapt run charter to make it a little bit more like SPC charter. Um, patient counter needs some more work, needs a better documentation, definitely needs a better sticker. So if anybody wants to help out with that, that would be good. And SPC charter is not too bad, but it needs um, some work done to create prime P charts and U charts for larger denominators. It's going to struggle a little bit with that just now. And it needs testing, so I haven't really, well, I've done my own testing when I make mistakes, but I haven't got like proper unit tests in there just now. So that's it. Thanks to all these folk who've helped out and given support during my time trying to develop these packages. And for everybody who's used them and liked them and feedback, thanks a lot. Really appreciate that. And that's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much. I mean, I've used the patient counter and it's so good and it's so quick. I was really impressed with it because I was trying to do something uh, that would have been way more complicated. So we've got a few questions that come in. I think the first one you've already answered because it's asking about packages for SPC chart, uh, which obviously you have given a good alternative for. 
Um, Zoe is wondering if you're planning to submit your packages to CRAN. Um, I don't know. It's quite. Um, if, if there's demand for it, I'm, I'll think about it. It's quite handy at the moment just to have it on GitHub. Um, but yeah, if people are interested, um, let me know. I guess some stars on there. The more more legs and stuff it gets, then I know if it's worth pushing. So yeah, I'm not not ruling it out. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I would love to have them on CRAN, but that's so selfish. I wouldn't. Do any other <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we've got another question. I think this will probably be the last one because we're running out of time. Uh, so run charter and SBC charter, can it output the data that informs the chart so it can be exported and output into another software, for example, Power BI? Yeah, you get well, you get the on both, you'll get a, a table. So you could save that as a variable um, and then interrogate that after, after the event. And you can choose with SPC charter, you can choose just to get the data only. So you don't have to get the plot. So it'll be even faster then. And I'll probably go back and do that with run charter as well. But yeah, you you get the table that comes out and tells you your initial um region or control limits and center line. And you can then use that for inputting in something else. Okay. So yes. Great. Well, I think we're gonna to have to stop here, but thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers and to all the people who have joined us this afternoon. I really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the discussions in the chat as well. Um... Thank you again. So thank you, John, uh, and thank you for, to all the speakers. Thank you, Emma, for helping facilitating this. And we are very excited to tell you that Alberta Cairo is already waiting for us in the next session. So it will start quarter past four. So uh, you have a quick break to have some coffee, and then uh, we will all uh, you will all move to the next session automatically. But also, as usually, you can use drop down menu in the top left corner and go to the session. Um, so thank you again, and I will see you soon. <laughs>